All right. Welcome, everybody, to episode 14 of the podcast, where we're doing a panel on humor and satire in science fiction and fantasy. And I got a very amazing cast of guest authors today, some very hilarious people, and I'm sure my face is going to hurt by the end of this. Uh, first up is Josiah Bancroft. Last time we talked, my face genuinely did hurt afterwards, so thank you for that. Uh, he's the author awesome. of the Books of Babel series, including Senlin Ascends, Arm of the Sphinx, The Hod King, and The Fall of Babel, which was just released last November. His new series, The Hexologists, is set to kick off later this year. So glad to see you again, Josiah. Welcome back. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, pleasure. And next we have Delilah Dawson. She's the New York Times bestselling author of Star Wars Phasma, Galaxy's Edge, Black Spire, The Perfect Weapon, and more. And she also co-writes the Tales of Pell series with our next guest. It's so very happy to have you here, Delilah. How are you doing? Glad to be here. Yeah. And also joining in on the fun is the New York Times bestselling author, Kevin Hearn. As I just mentioned, he and Delilah co-write the Tales of Pell series together. He's also the author of the Iron Druid Con Chronicles, the 2015 Star Wars novel, Heir to the Empire, and more. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Oh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank you for being here. And my dear friend, longtime friend, <laughs> Nicholas Eames. He's the author of The Kings of the Wild and Bloody Rose, books one and two in the band series. How are you, buddy? Wonderful. Thanks for having me. Uh, absolute pleasure. On such an esteemed Great. panel, no less. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Can't have you, can't have you in, a, in a company that you wouldn't be proud to be amongst. So. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, please put me on a panel with these exact people. Thanks. <laughs> this panel was all Nicholas's idea, even though it wasn't. Yeah. Cool. So uh, to ease into the topic of humor and satire, I thought it'd be good if you could all share an early memory or at least something that you can still recall today uh, of a fantasy or science fiction book that genuinely made you laugh. And building on top of that, why did that particular book uh, hit you so hard in the, in the funny bone? Uh, so Kevin, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, I started out uh, reading fantasy uh, with uh, Alan Dean Foster's series called Spellsinger, and I think he wrote six of those. And um, it, it reads a little bit different now because, of course, this was, you know, the early 1980s uh, when I was reading them. And, um, you know, things were different then. And uh, so the humor, if I go back and read it now, it might be a little bit different, not just because it was the 80s, but also because... I'm a different person. I'm older now. Things aren't necessarily as funny to me in the same way as they were when I was a kid. Um, but I love them. They had uh, uh, talking animals. And lo and behold, I wound up writing a book with a talking animal down the road, you know? So it was very formative uh, for me. And I found them hilarious. Uh, they had very distinct voices. And that was part of the, the humor to me as well. Uh, and, and, and how they differentiated themselves as characters. So, uh, yeah, I, I kind of, you know, got started with uh, Alan Dean Foster's uh, humorous kind of fantasy series called The Spellsinger, uh, a bard, basically, who was really terrible at his at his job. And that actually was also something that kind of wound up uh, happening in the Tales of Pell. So, um, yeah, it, it was a super formative series for me. Uh, and uh, I wrote I read a lot of other humorous stuff later on, but that was the first one. And it all comes first full circle. So like all these yeah. things coming back to inspire your work as an adult. Absolutely. <laughs> right on. And uh, Nicholas, what about you? What are, what are, what is an early memory of a book that really made you laugh and, and why was it so funny for you? Um, probably the books that made me laugh were, and they're not necessarily that funny, but like the lies of Locke Lamora mm -hmm. and Joe Abercrombie's work. It's not really formative. Like I wasn't too young when I read them, but um they just, they're pretty funny. And some people think Joe Abercrombie is like a little bit funny, but to me, he's funny on every single page. And it's obviously dark humor and it's always wrapped in, you know, like mis people's misery, <laughs> but I find it really enjoyable. <laughs> um, and so it was the, uh, the works of those two authors that made me think maybe I could do that, but like try a bit harder to be funny and see if it works. Yeah. And Delilah, what about you? I mean, my earliest one was probably uh, Lewis Sacker's Sideways Stories from Wayside School, um, which, you know, I, I think I got to those when I was like eight or nine from like the Scholastic Book Fair, uh, where I would also get every single Garfield or Farside book that came out. <laughs> um, but I just love the like 
it's very kind of absurdist, but palatable for children. Like, yeah, the, like the teacher just turns into a rat. <laughs> like, it's just a dead rat. It's been a dead rat the whole time has been your teacher. Or, you know, this child really needs to get a tattoo and they get a tattoo of a potato. Um, <laughs> it really got me. And then I, I didn't, you know, find anything else that funny again until in high school when my, my first boyfriend told me about Douglas Adams. And then, uh, Actually, no, I read Xanth too, but it, it kind of rubbed me wrong. So I didn't, it was like, one of those things, like I would like to like this, but I think I'd be a traitor to my gender. <laughs> and uh, Josiah, what were, what were some of your earlier memories of funny books? Uh, uh, probably uh, Last of the Mohicans, uh, James Nor Cooper. Uh, no, I'm joking. Uh, when I was in high I was school. Say, uh, I, I missed that <laughs> joke. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's terrible. Um, when I was in high deep school, deep our, our teacher let us like, pick our books for a semester. And uh, one of the uh, kids in the, the class picked uh, Grant Naylor's uh, Red Dwarf book, like one of the first Red Dwarf books that was published. And I had no idea what Red Dwarf was. Uh, and another one was The Last Mohicans, uh, which was not great. And so we read uh, Red Dwarf. And I remember reading that. And I was like, when does the dwarf show up? Like, I was so confused <laughs> for a long time. I was sure this is about dwarves. Um, but it was, it was like one of the first uh, kind of sci-fi comedies i'd read outside of uh, douglas adams who of course you know loved uh and it just it kind of like gave me a sense of the possibilities of what you could do with humor uh and and speculative fiction so uh, yeah red dwarf did red dwarf start as a book series and then become a tv show because i remember the tv show no so the way around it was a tv show first i didn't know about the tv show uh... i came at it from the bookend which is you know the wrong way around uh but the the, the writing of the books was like just as witty and funny as the tv show was Amazing. I mean, for me personally, uh, there are two series that stand out. One of them is not uh, obvious as being inherently funny, but the Redwall series by Brian Jocks. They had such mm, such subtle touches of humor throughout all the books. And I remember just loving that world and being so absorbed in it. And then when the humor came up, it just it vibed with me perfectly. And I found it so funny as a kid. And then on the flip side, there was uh lemony snicket's a series of unfortunate events which was very different from redwall much more dark and and satirical but i just loved that world and and i loved um i loved the crazy situations that these siblings found themselves themselves in and how the author just obviously the the author was using the persona of a narrator to narrate the story of these kids and then present it in as much of a dark and uh, tragic way as possible, but infuse it with so much humor that, that I just fell in love with it. Um, and I'm aging myself, obviously, as I think that series came out in the 90s and I'm a 90s kid. So, um, but yeah, I love, I love that series. And I guess that's why I was so disappointed when the, when the movies were quite underwhelming. Um, <laughs> But that's neither here nor there. Um, first off, we'll get into uh, what humor can do for stories. Uh, you know, we've been touching on it um, in terms of what we found funny young as uh, younger people and particular elements that were funny for us. But I'm curious from each of your perspectives, what is it that you find humor can actually do for a story, specifically stuff that comes from uh, science fictional or fantastical? Uh, lenses. So Delilah, we'll start with you. I mean, it just serves as the pressure release. You know, our job as authors is to create these characters and torture them as much as possible. Uh, but for most of us who aren't Joe Abercrombie, when things get dark and dark and dark, if you don't have that that release of pressure, it becomes kind of uncomfortable and unpleasant to read. We need moments of levity or, you know, even in the darkest moments, we need that kind of whistling through the graveyard humor. But it's just a, you know, it's most of us don't want something that's 100% grim. True. And this is no, no hatred towards the grim dark genre because there are people that love to, <laughs> to be uh, abused over and over again until the end of a book. But um, Nick, what about but who hurt them is what we want to know. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and uh, Nick, what about you? What's your take on that? Uh, I think it just helps stories feel more honest. I feel like fantasy, especially older fantasy, kind of ha concentrated so much on being like really stoic and really serious and you're missing like half of life. Like everyone goes to a funeral and no one cracks a joke. Like <laughs> I ain't been to that funeral. I've been to lots of them yeah. where most things said are jokes. Uh, and maybe my family's just nihilistic that way, but 
I think having having humor in things just makes makes everything seem more more real because I think a lot of human beings resort to humor in the face of you know doom and despair. So uh, I think without it, you're kind of missing half the fun. And especially in those small moments where you know it could be something as simple as discomfort, you might use humor as a way of coping with that particular situation and sort of attempting exactly. to gear it more towards something uh, less uncomfortable. And I'm I'm the same as yeah. you. It's like I've never been to a funeral that was that was so devoid of jokes. It's like you gotta tell some stories and crack some jokes about the person that you love and Yeah. yeah exactly. And Kevin, what about you? What's your take on humor and how it can or what it can do for, for stories? Well, it absolutely is a coping mechanism when you're uh, dealing with, you know, trauma, stressful situations, things like that. And, mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 you know, the spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down kind of thing. Uh, when when uh, uh, in Ink and Sigil, uh, my series, I'm actually kind of dealing with hu human trafficking, which is a really horrifying um you know, thing to exist. And, and it, it's, uh, there's really nothing funny about that, but if you have outside the edges of it, uh, some humor going on, you're able to perhaps, you know, deal with that more serious, uh, subject matter, um, a little bit better. And, um, so it, it allows you sometimes to examine things that would otherwise be, uh, the, maybe the kind of subject matter where people are like, eh, that's too intense. I'm going to set that down. You know, so that that helps us perhaps um, humor helps us process the stuff that we might have trouble processing otherwise. Mm -hmm. that, that that makes me think of I don't know if anyone I mean, this is taking a very depressing turn very quickly, but I will pivot as quickly as possible. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's um, Gulag Archipelago. I don't know if anyone's read that. Yeah. But how he was in Auschwitz and humor was one of the coping mechanisms that got a lot of people through that and help them maintain at least enough positivity or at least enough hope that they could look towards a future beyond those, uh, beyond those cages. Uh, and now Josiah's turn. <laughs> the pivot. Oh, thanks. Uh, 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 uh. Well, no, I, I think like, uh, the, the panel's already touched on like so many, like the important things, like it's, it's, it's some, uh, as a coping mechanism, it's also like inherently human. And I think that one of my frustrations with some of the sort of classic, science fiction especially like uh especially the the sort of hard science fiction that pretends that in the the far-flung future one of the things we strip away from ourselves is any humor and we we become just these argus-eyed logicians who just you know look into uh the distance uh without any any laughter and i i always find it to be like um, unbelievable because i think like like it is a quintessentially like human quality to want to laugh to to, to see the absurdity in life I also think that, like, you know, uh, humor is this incredible barge that you can move so much content upon that you can't do elsewhere. Like, that's I, – I am my most honest when I, I use humor often. Like, there's things you can say with humor that you can't just say straight. And so that's one of the things I, I love about using humor in writing is that it's, it's so um, flexible in that regard. Yeah. Well, Josiah, since we're on you so, – uh, go ahead, Delilah. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, I – my 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 greatest example of this was like I was going for um, a trail ride on my horse on my birthday one year and I got thrown. I landed on my back and my friend was like, oh, my God, are you paralyzed? Are you dead? Like, are you OK? And like. I just looked at the sky and went, happy birthday to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like you're laying there. I didn't know if I was paralyzed or not. I didn't know if I'd broken my back or my skull. But like that was the first human instinct was just like a joke. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because it's the it's the thing that obviously it frames the situation for you and it allows you to be the most honest you can be to think like, yeah, it's my birthday and happy fucking birthday to me. I got thrown off a horse. Mm -hmm. And then everything else from that doesn't necessarily have to be like, oh, do I need to call an ambulance, blah, blah, blah. That joke is enough for people to signal and understand. Yeah, she's good. She's good. It's fine. I mean, I wasn't good. I'd broken my back. Oh, you did break your back. Oh no, I did break my back. But I drove home. Like, but it was a great birthday. <laughs> okay, but... it was not. <laughs> it's memorable. I've got a lot of Percocet for my birthday. You're just very. Birthday. You're just very strong. Then it's like you cracked a joke before you told anyone. I, and a vertebrae. I broke my back. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I want to get into we kind of touched on this a little bit, but finding sort of a, a balance between um, humor and 
more serious elements of a story. Um, you know, whether it's a difficult situation or whether it's two characters arguing, what have you. But um, for each of you, I'll I'll direct the question to uh, Kevin first. How do you how do you find when reading a book uh, the the balance between humor and and more serious moments? You know, we have stuff like Terry Pratchett, which is purposefully purposefully very satirical and consistent with that satire. Uh, and then you have other books where it's infused a bit more sparingly. So from your perspective, what is the right balance there, or is it more contextual depending on any given author or uh, a given story? Um, well, a, a little bit. Uh, my particular books are seen as humorous books, but they're not marketed that way. Um, and they're, they're marketed as action adventure kind of things. And, and they, they are, they're action adventure books, but a lot of people, when they're doing the word of mouth thing and they're telling their friends about it, you got to read this book cause it's funny. And so they're talking about the humor rather than the action and adventure stuff. And I think that that's kind of an interesting, um, thing because what, what's happening with the marketing on the shelf is this is not a humor book. But the marketing word word of mouth is this is a humor book. And if you look at stuff that's on the shelf, very few authors actually get marketed as humor authors. Terry Pratchett is your big example and, and Douglas Adams being the other one. Those are kind of the big two uh, of like these are humorous novels in the sci-fi fantasy genre. Maybe, um, you know, the Xanth books might be another example, but um, these are your humorous books and everybody else has humor in it, but they don't get marketed that way. It, it is a much lo- smaller proportion of the overall material, I guess. Um, and then people will say, oh yeah, this is also funny, or this is a really funny book to begin with when they do their word of mouth. So um, I, I think that in terms of, it, from the marketing department, the the ratio of humor has to be pretty low, just based on the way they do things, that they don't want to think about it as a humor book, because Aside from those breakouts, they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to market a humor book. It doesn't seem to sell as well. People maybe don't want to be seen as, oh, I'm purchasing a humor book because maybe that is not seen as a serious read or something like that. And so they want to pick up something that looks a little bit more serious and adult or whatever. And uh, then they they feel good about laughing as a – that's humor is a bonus rather than the main thing that they're coming for. So, um, but it's in terms of how I write with it, um, I, I just have a comic relief character usually in my books and I don't plot them. <laughs> it's just situational and, uh, whatever is going on, they might have a comment to drop in there and, uh, and there you go. That's, that's how I approach it. Well, we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more, but I'm, I'm curious if anyone else has any thoughts jumping off on what Kevin just said about sort of like the the balance and the marketability of, of humor and, and why humor might be looked down upon in a way uh, from a marketing standpoint or from potentially a reader standpoint, if anyone wants to get in there. Well, I mean, from a reader standpoint, obviously, I think it's really subjective. I mean, some people, you know, what people find funny is all over the place. I've read so many, so many reviews in my book that say, you know, it's the humor of a 12 year old boy. And I'm like, <laughs> have you ever met a 50 year old boy? It's the same humor. <laughs> like, okay, I'm sorry, but um, yeah. And so it's very, very subjective. And then as far as like, I mean, Kevin touched on something for sure. there. like publishing is very, especially now they they're kind of risk adverse a lot of the time. Um, and I know that when I was trying to get my book sold, like the first publisher that took a look at it, um, wanted all, most of the, all the humor taken out um, just to try to make it more just like something that had already been successful. So um, luckily I managed to find someone that was cool with it slipping in. But um, even then they do, they do try to temper it so that, um, and rightly so, so that the absurdity of certain things doesn't, um, you know, make the more poignant moments seem less of less value. Um, but ultimately, when I'm reading a book, I think it's I think it only adds to it because the more I laugh, the more I relate to those characters, the more I'm invested in that story. And the more when something tragic happens, yeah. uh, I'm I'm like, you know, it affects me a lot more if I'm if I've laughed at those characters. Mm-hmm. 
Delilah or I, I think also it's, it's 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 partly because publishers have no sense of humor. Like they were just born without a sense of humor, <laughs> and that's what drew them to publishing. Well, and so, uh, <laughs> just nah, just is not like trying to get you, published. It's fine. Nah, nah, whatever. <laughs> but it's like like you know, I kind of come from a background of like I had my my masters in, in literature, I read a lot of like you know the classics and stuff like that. And boy, if your book had humor in it, it was already lowbrow. I mean, there's just so few books that got elevated to the, like the canon that had any sort of humor in them. And if they did, it was one of those things you were like, well, you have to understand this humor is an important commentary upon the absurdist of living in this blah, blah, blah. And so it couldn't, they couldn't just be funny because there was no value in that. Yeah. And I think one of the things that like, you know, maturity has taught me is like, man, there is a lot of value in just laughter and having some fun and enjoying the absurdity of this experience of, of living, you know, and even if it's not, not some grand commentary, it's not devoid of, of value. So, yeah, Delilah. And just humor is terribly hard to do well. You know, it's one thing to tailor your humor to a person you've known a long time or a group of people who, you know, share a similar culture as you. But I mean, like, if you think about stand up comedians, they go out there and they bomb and they bomb and they bomb, and then they get one joke that gets laughs. And they're like, okay, put that one in the pot. And they bomb for 40 more minutes <laughs> and they do that 100 times and they have 40 jokes. You know, and we can't do that with the book. We get one chance. <laughs> And if anybody goes, oh, this is not for me, then they they don't pick up the book again. So we have to be, you know, very choosy. And it also helps, you know, as a writer to have this whole team of, you know, agent and editors and these other kind of filters that let you know if your joke lands. It may be really fun to you and your family and, and your friends. Then other people are just like, I don't get it. So yeah. it's and it's, you know, if, if a book is mostly, you know, adventure and drama, we go along with that. And we're like, oh, sure. These are a logical series of events that happen. And I can go along with that in almost any book, but in humor, if one joke lands wrong, it's it's like a, a brick wall coming down, <laughs> and it you know you just assume yeah. this, but this book doesn't work for me. Yeah, it's a strange thing that humor has that effect that I think people, for some reason, are much more critical of of the um, the bad execution than a lot of other things. If there's a if there's a bad character, you know or mediocre character, let's say, people aren't going to say, oh, God, that character just ruined everything for me to the point where, you know, out of 15 characters, that one took me out of the book and I did not finish it. Versus a bad joke, which can sometimes land so wrong with somebody that they that they put down a book and say, I can't finish that scene. And then it could lead to, I can't finish that book or some, yeah. I, I feel like it's, it's partly because a lot of readers realize they can't be writers, but most of them think they're comedians. Like they're like, like I'm, I'm funny. <laughs> like most of the people that I meet are like, oh, I'm, I'm pretty hilarious. I'm like, well, are you? You know, and, and, and it's that sort of, <laughs> they, they, they are more critical of humor than they are of the prose. Yeah. But they don't understand, I guess, the, the work and the intention that goes, goes into that. Um, you know, and Delilah, like you say, there's so many, uh, there's so many passes that, that, a book takes in order to get to publication, but those passes also take into account the jokes. And it's like, if the jokes don't land, your editor is going to say something, your agent's going to say something, somebody's going to say something. Or if you have a trusted confidant outside of publishing who you bounce your ideas off of, bounce your jokes off of, if it doesn't land with them, that too. Yeah. Can Kevin? I circle back something real Everything goes through my cat first. <laughs> oh, your, cat, your poor cat. All this shit that she has to hear. <laughs> oh, yeah, loves it. Can I circle back to something Nicholas was saying, though? Uh, I, yeah. I really agree with this idea that if you have characters that uh, people have bonded with through humor and they just sort of like them, then when when tragedy strikes or something, you know, sort of deeply emotional happens, uh, people tend to feel it a lot harder because they almost weren't expecting it. And, and, and so it, it actually hits them with the force of a tragedy a little bit more um, than if they were going in expecting to read a tragedy, you know, right. they're, they're prepared. But sometimes when things happen in a book that's kind of light and then you, you suddenly, you know, bring the hammer down, they find themselves bawling. I, I've had a, a, my sixth book, I had all these emails coming in from people saying, God damn it. I was listening, I was listening to this audio book on the road. And you had me crying so hard. I had to pull over, you know, they, they, <laughs> things like that. And it, how did you, how dare you, you know? And um, so, so I think that that's uh, something, uh, you know, that, that humor is capable of doing is actually intensifying some of the other emotions that we feel uh, and, when we're reading. Yeah. And, and you see that in someone 
you know, people may not love Shakespeare, but Shakespeare is so <laughs> prominent for a reason. Go ahead, Josiah. What do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> I, you could start off like any high school class that way. Like, people may not love Shakespeare, but we do have to like <laughs> still read it. But they're gonna. They're gonna read it. You don't have a choice. That's true. It's like oh, there's nothing worse than like your your like high school teacher telling you why the Tempest was funny. Oh my god! Like you'd be sitting there going like oh, this line oh, by this Caliban character, hilarious. Like this is the worst class. I hate this. But whatever, Josiah aside, uh, <laughs> Shakespeare, while the humor may not land necessarily for, for modern people. The humor was always a prominent aspect in a lot of Shakespeare's work. And Kevin, like you say, and Nicholas as well, you have that, I guess, uh, broadening of the spectrum of what this character can feel emotionally from the emotions of laughter to the emotions of tragedy and pain. And it makes it all hit harder because you have that empathy built up over the course of reading or hearing what they've gone through in different situations and so when shit hits the fan and you're just like oh no delilah broke her back then you really feel for her when she says happy birthday to me you know <laughs> yeah. um so i want to get into each of your uh, individual works uh we'll start off with nicholas if you can tell listeners and viewers more or less how you approached uh your writing with the idea of wanting to include humor in it. Sure. Um, well, I've been working on another book for about 10 to 12 years. That was not funny whatsoever. It had no jokes in it. It was just sort of like an amalgamation of all my favorite authors slapped together and me learning all the writing lessons that I needed to learn. Um, and I just, yeah, I just, for so long, I've been writing something that was not necessarily like true to my own voice. Um, and so when I was finally sending that away for the third time to be rejected, um, I was like, let's just write something that's totally the opposite. So for years and years, if you told me like, oh, this book's got goblins in it, I wouldn't have touched it with a 10 foot pole because I was like, I'm way too, I'm 30. I don't read books about goblins. So, so serious. Um, <laughs> and then I was just like, well, why? Like all those things that made me fall in love with fantasy in the first place. So I just started writing a book that was pretty much the opposite of what I've been doing for the last 12 years. and so. That turned out to be, you know, my own voice, something written in my own voice instead of, you know, Brandon Sanderson slash Stephen Erickson slash, you know, Guy Gabriel K or whatnot. Um, yeah. So, and I, and just in general life, I try to be funny quite a bit. And so I tried to be funny quite a bit in the writing too. And I approached it from a point of trying to make the book as fun as possible. So I do get some, some like, lack sometimes about the lack especially my first book the lack of consequences um but you know what book has consequences like every other one <laughs> don't so read my book if here's something a little bit different every other book's got consequences for your actions yeah. here's one without it just you know um and so yeah if i could get a couple good jokes out of it like you know someone gets their hand cut off but if i can get a joke that when it grows back it smells like starfish because they use like starfish genes in it then i'll use it i don't care if it's not realistic so that was my approach. Fun first. And I've had whiskey with you and you are definitely funny. I don't think you try that hard. I try. I, don't, yeah. I think it happens unconsciously. <laughs> and uh, Delilah, what about you? What was your approach uh, to introducing humor into your work? Was it something that happened consciously or did it just kind of flow out? I mean, my, my books that I wrote on my own, you know, it was more of a, those little like Thomas Kincaid touches of gold at the end mm. where somebody just says something kind of sharp or cutting or funny. Yeah. Like I have this horror book for, it's a teen horror book called Servants of the Storm where this guy's describing this like horrible process where these demons like turned him into um, a cambion or whatever. And it's like, it's kind of gross and terrible and traumatic. And at the end, the girl's just like, dude, you boinked a demon. <laughs> you know, just that concept of that little bitty smoke escape. So, yeah. you know, in, in my earlier work, it was, it's, and in my, like my Star Wars book and most of my work, it's just that tiny little touch of gold. And then, and then Kevin and I got into the tales of Pell and that was just <laughs> falls out all the time. We're, we're, we're going to get into the tales of Pell. Well, uh, Kevin, do you want to, do you want to uh, let us know about your approach as well? And then uh, after Josiah, we'll dig a little bit deeper into the co-writing yeah. process. Well, um, I, uh, I basically started the Iron Druid Chronicles with the dog. Um, I, I wanted to have a talking dog because I just love dogs. And uh, I'm like, can I write a book with that and make that work? Uh, 
And uh, so then I had to come up with a magic user who could talk to dogs somehow. And uh, I didn't want to do a wizard or a witch because those have like a master servant familiar relationship that I didn't like. Didn't like that vibe. So I thought a druid might work. Then I had to do all my research on why druids would be around in the modern day with the dog. So uh, once I figured that stuff out, I was ready to go. And what what's wonderful about having the dog be uh, this source of humor is that they really are Taoists. They live in the present. Um, they don't think about the past. They can't remember it. And they don't really can't look too far into the future except, you know, am I going to play or am I, you know, going to eat something or take a nap? And, and that's that's pretty much it. So it has this, uh, you know, way of uh, basically coloring everything the way they look at the world. And then it also, uh, you know, provides, uh, you know, some, some entertaining commentary on what the humans are doing there. They always reset the human experience into the dog experience. And um, that has been a blast. And that, that was kind of what I was wanting to do there, that they are always reminding humans, they're playing the, the part of a fool from like a Shakespearean uh, fool. Like, hey, I, I'm observing you and this is what I'm seeing and I'm, I'm making fun of you because your priorities are messed up, King Lear or whoever, right? So. And the fool, the fool is always a foil for, yeah. for whoever is taking themselves far too seriously. Exactly. And I love it now. I'm going to start thinking about every dog as Taoist. <laughs> there, there you <laughs> go. You're all Taoist da- dogs now. Absolutely. And, uh, Josiah, what about you? What's your what's your approach? Um, and did you consciously decide I'm going to start introducing humor into my work, or how did it go? The f- the first rejection I ever got uh, was from the BBC when I was 17, and I sent them a sitcom uh, pitch with a script uh, that I'd written with a friend, and they wrote me back. An actual, honest to god, BBC producer sat down and dictated a letter. And he wrote me back. It was, it was two sentences. Uh, and I remember them, uh, but it was, uh, we here at the BBC recommend that you live a little bit, little, live a little bit more and write about it less. Uh, all the best. And that was it. <laughs> uh, and, and, wow. and, uh, yeah, no, it was brutal. It was brutal, but also fair. He was it was funny. Fair. It was fair. Um, uh, and, and so like, I always wanted to like write humor. I've not been good at it for most of my life. I've gotten a little bit better, but I feel like humor for me is like the, voice of the outsider and so as somebody who has moved around a lot in my life and been uh, kind of continually like on the outside of communities uh, uh it's been a way to kind of break in uh so i've, I've you know developed a sense of like usually self-deprecating humor just as a, a sort of a way to uh bridge that gap between the inside and the outside and so when you started you know i started writing you know fantasy uh, about outsiders it just seemed natural that it would include that sort of voice or that vocal range of humor uh even if i haven't quite mastered it yet so yeah i've been doing it for a long time and it's just something i've also lived uh, for better or worse and now that you've been doing it for for so long we'll get into the next topic which is how humor and satire presents unique challenges especially in your cases as you are writing it down on the page and so josiah we'll start with you when you're writing humor down and presenting it textually how does that compare to telling somebody a joke or uh, hearing a joke or watching it in a film or TV or a stand-up comedy special or something like that? Um, it gives you more opportunity to uh, uh, practice self-loathing. Like you can go back the next day and be like, yeah, you think you're so funny, do you? You fraud, you phony, you big potato. And then you can revise it a little bit, make it a little bit better. And so that's, 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 that's the big difference. Not, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, like writing down jokes is like inhabiting a voice for a character and having the narrative voice and letting it flow. And you go back and you do some criticism, and you, you give it a, another pass, but you do just have to allow for the sort of spontaneity of it. And so a lot of like the, the humor that emerges uh, for me from drafts is, is kind of the, the coincidence of, of, the, the moment you know and so if something pops into your head you write it down uh and if it survives uh yeah the the gauntlet of of revisions and editors and readers and makes it to the final draft then you, you call it a success but i mean it, I, I i very rarely kind of uh have prepared jokes up my sleeve it just sort of comes out or doesn't so mm-hmm. yeah. yeah delilah what about you uh have you found that there are some unique challenges to presenting humor uh on, yeah i mean on the, the biggest problem is that uh 
from the joke to its reception is usually about two years. So <laughs> it's not like telling people a joke and they laugh. And you're like, oh, good. My self-esteem didn't take a hit this time. Yay, 13-year-old me. Delayed, um, satisfa- instead, delayed you, satisfaction. <laughs> you write it, and then you edit it, and then you edit it, and then you copy edit it, then you copy edit it, and then it shows up at your house, and then you dread it, and then it comes out, and then people tell you if it's horrible. So it's um, a very challenging way to get feedback on something because there's a very long lag time. And quite often, uh, you know, you, you don't find out for quite some time that nobody else quite gets the joke that you think is hilarious. <laughs> um, my first book um, I wrote in kind of like a fever dream when I was getting like three hours of sleep with a newborn and it was chiclet and I was just trying to put everything in it to make it fun and funny. And, uh, you know, I just I remember writing it me like, I am so clever. This is so clever. <laughs> and almost any time a writer is thinking the words, I am clever, like that needs to be cut. That's not good for yeah. you. <laughs> um, like, the first line was about, like, it was like, you know, uh, uh, the story begins on the day that I learned one of life's great truths. We were not meant to crap standing up while wearing capri pants. And I thought that was the funniest first line on earth. And every agent was like, no, maybe don't use diarrhea in the first line. <laughs> idea." <laughs> Uh, so my writing got a lot better when I dropped that approach. And all the Capri wearing but it just took 57 like, rejections. Delilah, what are you thinking? Yeah. Don't tell everyone what actually happens clever. at home. <laughs> it would happen in Greece. It happened in a in a tur- in a stand up bathroom in Greece is where that happened. But yeah, no, it's but that's the thing. Like you think it's funny at, at you know three in the morning, and then someone tells you that it's not, and sometimes it's two years later on Goodreads that you get to hear about that. So that's the hardest part for me is the the lack of immediate. Uh, you know, if a dog gets into the cookies, you want to smack it on the nose right now, not two years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that's true. Kevin, what about you? Well, uh, I, I agree with this, but I also um, I, I also treasure the part that, you know how like when, when you're in a situation and you walk away and about, I don't know, five minutes down the road, you think of the perfect thing to say yeah. and, and you that's never get a chance to go egg. back there. Well, yeah, with, with writing, you get to, you know, to kind of, you do have the chance to try at least to think of the perfect thing to say. You might not mm-hmm. be successful, but at least you have the, the opportunity to try more than being on the spot in a, you know, in a pressure situation and having to come up really quick wittedly with, with something uh, you have the time with writing the, you know, the luxury of being able to uh, craft the perfect thing to say. So um, I enjoy that aspect of it. And, uh, but like Delilah says, it doesn't always land um, I have stuff where, you know, my editor just says, what? It, I think this is supposed to be a joke, <laughs> is it? And, and so you, you just know that that, you know, that did not land the way you thought it was. And you yeah. thought it was hilarious. But, you know, whatever was happening in your head is not happening on the page. So, um, yeah, you have to uh, develop a thick skin for it, I suppose. Uh, and, and, you know, most of the jokes do land and that's cool. Um, but uh, the ones that don't, you just eh, chuck them. It's you know, no big deal. There's plenty more where that came from. Yeah. And be, and learn to be patient with your, with your gratification and satisfaction yeah. with <laughs> yeah. whatever, however your joke is going to be uh, received by, by audiences. Nick, do you want to, do you want to finish off on this topic? Sure. Um, also, I see Kevin didn't get the memo about having a bookshelf in the background today. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. The bookshelves are actually facing me. So I get to admire them. You okay. don't yeah. read. Yeah, we know it. <laughs> <laughs> Exposed. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I think for me at least, it's more of like more of like when not to put jokes in because I, at least in real life, I'm the kind of person that definitely probably jokes too often. You know, I've never looked at a dessert menu without being like, "Oh, I have one of everything." Like, I, <laughs> you know, despite not being a dad, I've got their full repertoire of humor. So um, you took you took it yeah, from me. Pretty much every line, I'm like, "Time for a joke." No, okay, moving on. And so I, I'm always like, "Where can I put one in? Where can I put one in?" And, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, holding off until, until a joke really needs to be in there, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, building, building off of that, this is perfect jumping point for how you perhaps, um, how you view a scene. So in, during the writing process, when you're writing a particular scene or a chapter, at which point are you thinking, okay, this is the moment to put humor in there, or this is the moment to take humor out, uh, or before the scene is even on the page and you're just forming it in your head, whether you're thinking, does this scene need to have some humoristic or satirical element in order to make it really land and, and punch as hard as it can? So Nick, if you want to get off on that. 
Sure, yeah. I mean, I think I'm pretty good at, at least when it comes to writing, uh, knowing when a joke needs to be said. In real life, I'm awful at it. But uh, in writing, yeah, I think I'm pretty good at finding that moderation, you know, adding humor in, even during the poignant scenes. But there's definitely been a few times um, where my editors have been like, this is too absurd. This is too crazy. Can you please tone it down? And almost every time I've toned it down. Uh, there's been a couple times I've stuck to my guns um, just because it's a good character just needs to be funny. But usually I will capitulate and turn it over. The one like, like when I first got an agent, I have a scene in my first book where everyone bites with boners because, you know, <laughs> because it happens. Um, I don't know why people think it's juvenile, but uh, no. when my agent first, you know, first had it that was call, an outlander, was like, it's real. We were all <laughs> in high school locker rooms. We know how it is. They're a part of life. But uh, anyways, my agent was like, okay, blah, blah. She was like, she was 100% going to take me on. But she's like, I think that scene's got to go. And I'm like, absolutely. You're right. It's gone. Um, but then I was talking to my friends and I was like, hey, I got an agent, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. She just said that scene has to go. And every one of them was like, you got to keep it. You got to keep yeah. it. So um, I went back to her and I was like, what if I just kind of tone it down a bit, take out certain words, uh, like gestating, you know, for instance. Um, and and down we got to a place where everyone, everyone felt it was acceptable. <laughs> what is like the acceptable level of boner in this case? Yeah. I need to, I need to reread that well, scene. Well, not one that's gestating. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> if it, yeah, if it could also describe an alien egg hatching, it's a no-go apparently for a while. Oh, man. <laughs> um, Josiah, what about you when you're approaching a chapter or a scene? Um, how do you, how do you think about the, the necessity of humor in that scene, or at least your desire to put it in for the sake of, uh, what that scene or chapter is trying to convey? I, I, I wish that I, I had any sort of like forethought or, or grand plan, but I just sit down and start like making crap up. And, and sometimes it's, it's funny. Sometimes it's not. I mean, I, I do think that like, uh, like I was saying earlier, I, I think that like humor is part of like the human condition. And so just in the same way that somebody could be mean or upset or, you know, friendly, they can also be humorous. And so it's just part of the palette. You know, so it's it's not something I, I necessarily sit down and say, like, uh, here's here's where we need some humor. That said, I really do like uh, like to in sections or chapters with uh, a little bit of a, a punch. And so I, I will sneak in some some humor at the end of uh, sections and chapters just because I want the reader to turn the page, you know, and if they're smiling, maybe they will. So, I'm, you know, it, that, that's as far as my calculation gets. Otherwise, I, when I go back and read my, my, my stories, I think they're hilarious all the way through. And apparently I am the only one. So that's that's <laughs> part of the joke. Uh, but, you know, uh, my, my editor never has never come back and said, this joke didn't land because I just don't think he sees any jokes there. He's just like, these are just people talking, but you know, <laughs> I, I, I think it's funny. So yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it, I would say it's subtle. Um, um, so subtle that, that no one knows that, you know, that's, that's, that's how you know you're really having a good time. Until I, until I leave you on a cliffhanger. That's it. Yes. Well, sure. <laughs> and uh, Delilah, what about you? How do you, sorry to interrupt your, your sip of tea. Or, by holding a spoon <laughs> <laughs> how do you how do you approach uh, chapters or scenes um in terms of how you want to implement humor into it i i don't um really think ahead very much um i i'm a very kind of in the moment i think a first draft's like carrying laundry like you hold on to everything you have and run like hell and hope you make it to the bed without dropping too many socks so i am not thinking about any part of uh, you know, that kind of like interior organization until much later. Um, I tend to like, I, like I've said, like, I'm really lucky. I have an agent, I have editors, so I'll kind of put in whatever I think is going to work and let them tell me what doesn't work. Um, you don't have that necessarily when you're uh, a new writer who doesn't have an agent yet, at which point, you know, that's part of developing your voice and developing, you know, your craft is trying to find that balance of just the right amount of anything. And you're probably going to donk it up for a while at first. And then you know, as you begin to get feedback and level up, you get a better feel for when those things come. So by now I've been doing this for 10 years. I don't really, it just kind of happens. And then in later rewrites, if I think things have been kind of boring for a while, or, you know, things have been a little too grim, then I'll try to find that little ping. But uh, later that would become in like a third or fourth draft where I started to actually notice the, you know, the little 
heartbeat of it. If it went too long without a heartbeat, <laughs> I'd add one. It's like the story's flatlining. I need to put some humor in there. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's so the first time I wrote a couple of books, my agent said, you don't seem to have a really great handle on tension. So she had me do um, an Excel spreadsheet for every chapter of the chapter, how many pages, what happened in it, what major you know conflicts or minor conflicts were in it, and then to rate it um, one to 10 on a level of tension. So she was like, if you have a whole bunch of ones in a row, people are going to get bored and quit. If you have a bunch of tens in a row, people are going to get like, and quit. So you, know, you want like, you know, you started a three and then it goes up to a seven and then it goes back down to a five and then it goes up to a nine and it goes down to a two. So you want that more jagged edge. So I did have to, at the beginning, um, kind of go into my books and make sure artificially that the little fine lines of tension, excitement, humor, moments of mercy were kind of a little bit more evenly distributed. Keep people hooked and roping them along, not tossing them into the fire. <laughs> and uh, Kevin, what about you in terms of uh, scenes and uh, chapters yeah. and how to incorporate humor? Um, what makes us laugh is always um, that we're surprised. Like, like if you want to think about slapstick humor, you know, when somebody just suddenly takes, you know, a slip and falls on their butt or whatever in a comedic way, you know, the, you didn't expect them to fall right then. And so you laugh, you're surprised and you laugh. And, uh, but the same thing can be accomplished through, you know, just, just words. You didn't expect that character to say that thing right then. And that makes you laugh. And, and so, um, it, it is always an element of surprise. And this is why I really like having the characters who are kind of on the sidelines and observing and then making their observations. And I have them not just over on the dog in the iron Druid Chronicles, but, uh, it's an ink and sigil too. I've got a hobgoblin named Buck Foy and uh, he is always making comments from his uh, perspective on things. You know, he's not human. And so he sees things differently. Um, and then later in the Iron Drew Chronicles, I have a character who comes forward in time. He was from 2000 years in the past. And he thinks modern humans are incredibly irrational and, you know, not making good decisions. So, and, he, and often he just doesn't understand things. So his comments are often, you know, from, uh, you know, a different perspective as well. And so all of that lends to surprise, all of that lends to humor. And so um, it kind of weaves itself sort of naturally just by dint of the characters that I've got. Uh, I don't have to necessarily plan it. It's just that who they are means that they're going to say things that are surprising and that are therefore humorous. And this dovetails perfectly into my next topic, which is characters. And Kevin, since we're on you, we'll, we'll dig a little bit deeper. Are you, you know, you've, you've talked about Buck Foy and, and these characters that you purposefully created um, to have, I guess, an outsider's perspective that then acts as a, a lens through which to view the humorous sides of some different aspect of your story. So how, mm -hmm. how, um, how purposeful is this, is this, uh, character creation? And then how do you find that right balance with these characters? And then also the balance between something that we've touched on earlier, which is emotion and humor. Uh, these two things that, that play this very fine game with each other. Yeah. Um, well, they're, it, it is very purposeful that they're outsiders, um, and uh, because it, because of that, uh, we've talked about how they they can be humorous and you know through their perspective, but they are also helping the uh, main protagonists um, grow as well because um, they have to kind of you know they're forced to look at things from a different way, and um, also these characters tend to have some. Uh, deep need of their own that they're trying to work through. Uh, in, in Buck Foy's case, he was, uh, you know, traumatized from, uh, being in, in fairy. He wanted, you know, he believed he would be killed if he ever returned. He really needed to stay on earth just to survive. And, um, he's afraid of, of other Fey in a lot of ways because of it. He always thinks he's a target. Um, you know, and then, um, Owen, who comes back from, you know, the past, uh, he is constantly confused by modern technology and the fact that so much of the world has been paved or, you know, covered in, you know, glass and steel. Now the natural world is pretty much gone. Um, and, and so he, he's bewildered by that and deeply hurt by it and needs to, you know, deal with that particular trauma on an ongoing basis. So, um, 
yeah, the the hum- it, it's planned what what comes from them, but but that planning is not entirely. Well, I'm just going to have a, a person here who's just going to deliver uh, jokes, uh, and that's kind of it. Um, I think even in a case where you know C3PO and R2D2, for example, in Star Wars were really intended to be comic relief all the time, and they are. The thing about them is uh, that, um, and it's a problem throughout the entire Star Wars universe, is that hey, they're slaves. Droids are are, are enslaved beings, and, and with their own intelligence, and um, there's there, it's never really addressed. So I, I every time I see a droid in the Star Wars universe, I look at that and go, okay, you're there to be comedic, but at the same time it's really tragic what, you know, your existence. And, and I, I kind of think that that's the case um, for a lot of humorous characters that they have uh, this funny side to them, but there's also a deeply uh, traumatized side of them too, to explore. Uh, so there you go. I hope that answered the question. I don't know if it did or not. No, that, that was great. That was a great way to spark this off. Nicholas, what about you in terms of creating characters with uh, um, emotion and depth, but also humor in mind? Yeah, it's definitely something that I've not found that I've done. Obviously, like I like Kevin said, I do have I read characters, you know, could make a joke at any point. But I de- in both my books so far and in the third one, I've got characters that are they're the person that if I've got a joke that I don't think is going to get past my editors, I just have them say it because they're so ridiculous that they can kind of say anything. So they're the kind of like my you know my mouthpiece for the most ridiculous jokes. So in the first book, it's a you know, the wizard that wears the one piece pajamas in the second book, it's a sadder, you know, um, who's like their, their, their manager. And both those characters, like also, like Kevin said, do have like, I didn't think about it until he said it, but do have pretty traumatic backgrounds um, and some of the sadder stories in the books, but they're definitely the most ridiculous characters. And so I'm not sure if I'll always do it, but at least in the next book I'm writing, I do have a character that's, He's just ready to say absolutely anything that's ridiculous that I'm like, can I sneak this one in? Let's try having this character say it. And then unconsciously, he'll have a traumatized background. Perhaps the humor is... is he probably will. It, per, perhaps yeah. the humor in that case is, as we've touched on before, their way of dealing with their trauma. Kevin, you brought that up. Nicholas, even if you didn't necessarily think about it, while writing and creating those characters, that's just something that infused into into their being just from... Yeah, just from a, I guess, real life um, comparison and everything that you pulled to make that character a reality. Yeah, and I think like what, like how we talked about earlier about having you know when that character is so funny, so funny, so funny, and then when they do finally break or snap or something really tragic happens to them, I think it just makes it all the more. Important. Agreed. Yeah, and Delilah, what about you? I mean, I agree that humor definitely, I think, comes from pain a lot of the time. And that, you know, the, the class clown is trying to, you know, make other people laugh to feel better about themselves or to shunt the attention away from their reality and their genuine pain into laughter. Um, so outside of Tales of Pell, you know, probably the, the humor books that I've written on my own would be uh, my Minecraft series, Mob Squad, um, which is kind of based on those 80s kids adventure movies like Goonies or Stand By Me, where kind of the kids go off and have their own adventure without parents. Um, But in both of them, you know, I have the character who's like the snarky one who's, you know, the kid that, uh, you know, makes the funny jokes and is loud and is big, fast with his fist. But then you like as the books go on, you see that he has like that that very soft, uh, gentle center that he's been trying to cover up the whole time. Um, But it is super fun just to have that character that, you know, you can throw out the outrageous things to say. Uh, I mean, it's it's Minecraft for kids. So there's a lot of butt jokes. (laughs) It's good to have somebody who can make the butt jokes. And uh, Josiah, what about you when you're creating your characters, you know, butt jokes aside? Uh, we do don't you... have to put them aside. We, we, can, we can put them front and center. That's fine. Um, <laughs> it's up to you. Uh, no, I, I, I think like a lot of like the humor comes from the fact that my characters are often satirical in nature. Like they're, they're, there's, there's a, a character that I'm lampooning or a character type, a stereotype that I'm lampooning. Uh, my, my books of Babel began with uh, my rereading of adventure stories from my youth. The H.G. Wells and Jules Verne sort of uh, variety of, of 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 you know adventure tales, and when you go back and read them as a, a adult, you're like, oh, these are horribly racist, misogynistic, like 
transcripts of terrible, terrible books. And so when I started writing the books of Babel, my main character, Thomas Sinlin, was sort of a, a Phineas Fogg, uh, you know, send up a, a lampoon. Like I wanted to to make fun of that erudite, competent white male who is always right and, and ready. Uh, and so a lot of the humor, especially in the first book, comes from just that. And, and that, that, can, that sort of satire continues in the rest of the series, for better or worse. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that like the humor for the creation of the characters, at least in that series, was, was essential because there was something I wanted to uh, pillory. I wanted to say like, hey, this is, this is deserving derision and mockery. We should, we should look at this again. It's, sort of, it's, it's ridiculous. So, yeah. And as the series went on, as you created more characters or... I think when we spoke back in uh, back in the fall, you mentioned that one of your char- favorite characters, who, uh, Iren, Iren, I can't remember how to pronounce it. Um, Either spine, whatever you like. All right, Iren. Uh, she her sense of humor is much more uh, physical, uh, and the mm-hmm. way that she interacts with the world based on the fact that she's this humongous woman. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you realize that you could do so much more with her and you could, you could flesh out her character and give her so much more depth because you had the opportunity to write more books with more POVs. So how was that for I, you? And I, well, and I think that's like part of it. Like, you know, sometimes like in the first book, uh, you have these side characters who are sort of one note. And the wonderful thing about uh, extra books in a series is you get to expand upon those notes, make a melody, something more complicated and, and, and relatable. And, and Iron was one of the characters who I really enjoyed exploring because, uh, you know, at, at the sort of outset, she's, uh, I would say, sort of like laconic and, and, and obtuse and like she's uh, bristly and all that sort of stuff. But then as you get to know her, she has this, this sort of, candy center that's that's a lot of fun um and and she's got a a little bit of a raunchy side to her too which is fun to explore (laughs) so i mean but that's the kind of thing you get in the second third fourth books you can't you can't delve into all that stuff in the first Mm -hmm. uh which is the only thing that series have going for them that and the the advance the rest i mean don't write series (laughs) kids stay away single books you heard it here first we spoke last time and you said I don't want to write any more series. And then you signed oh, God, a series no. deal with Orbit. <laughs> well, they, had, they, they, break, they came with a large bag of money. And I said, well, I do like Six money. figures, baby. I don't like series. <laughs> there you go. So, I'm, you know, I, I'm, yeah. But it's, it, so that's the good thing. You can like develop the characters to then later disappoint your readers, which I mean, it's all of our goals. Like when I get up in the morning, I'm like, I just want them to cry later. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, on the note of series, Delilah and Kevin, since you are co-writing the Tales of Pell together, first off, just uh, let listeners and viewers know how how that series came to be, how you two met and then ended up writing this, and then we'll dig a little bit deeper into it afterwards. Okay. Um, do you want to go, bud? I think you usually start when we talk about this, right? Okay. Uh, all right. Um, well, uh, what had happened is that... Uh, Delilah and I were in Dallas for uh, a signing with a bunch of other authors, uh, Rachel Kane, Jay Wells, Charlene Harris. We we did a, a wonderful event together, and then we went out for awesome Mexican food. We were just laughing so hard, and then the next day we had to uh, unfortunately get on the plane to uh, go home. And uh, so Delilah and I were in in the Dallas airport at like ten thirty a.m. And you're like, you know, the the airport restaurants, you know, they they sort of open. Yeah, in their airport restaurants, right? So there's this bar. Well, and everybody <laughs> told us like, oh, there's this one barbecue place at the at the airport. Like, you have to go to this place. Like, you can't go to Texas unless you go to this one restaurant. And it was closed. Yeah. So <laughs> so we wind up going to this <laughs> other barbecue restaurant, which nobody had recommended for good reason. But we we, we basically uh, get in there. We we get some terrible barbecue. We're sitting down. And um, I just kind of—it was like flappy. It was like flappy barbecue. Like it was like school lunch meat barbecue. Oh my yeah. god! It was just Fla- like flappy is know, not the word you want to hear when barbecue comes into the conversation. Yeah, the, that is, the, that's awful. It, it, the sauce was like ketchup and soy sauce. Anyway, the the um, you basically <laughs> you guys have got a to, school lunch. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was terrible. So uh, we paid airport prices. Yeah, oh. yeah, exactly. So. Um, but I, I started uh, to pitch an anthology, basically, an idea to uh, Delilah say, what if we kill the farm boy? Because the farm boy is such a staple of epic fantasy 
that uh, you know he he's this nobody, but there's he's got a secret destiny, and some old guy is going to come along and tell him, no, 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 little white boy, you are special somehow, and you are secretly the king or the next big grand wizard or whatever. So what if we instead kill that guy a lot over and over again? Because you know a bunch of different short stories written by different authors where the farm boy gets killed, um, but. We never got around to doing that particular anthology in about a well, year. Well, we tried, we tried, but it took we, so much organization and emails and math. Uh, yeah, it was a lot why of you're stuff. Not, this is why you're not publishers. Yeah. Editors. yeah. So uh, a year later, after you know the failure of getting that off the ground, Delilah emailed me and said, hey, buddy, why don't we just write a book together, call that, and go from there? I'm like, whoop. Oh, all right. That, well, that I think could... my pitch was you write half the book for twice the profit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> and uh, so we just started writing. I had no idea what this was like. I had never written with anybody before. And uh, and I don't think Delilah had either, I don't, I, right? But we were already friends. Uh, we were like, Let, let's, let's give this a shot and see what happens anyway. Let's write a few, you know, chapters. So we just came up with some characters um, this is and, all over Twitter DMs, by the way. Yeah, yeah. You can even and, do and this then, over uh, video calls. I, I think I wrote a, a, a chapter and emailed it to her, and then uh, she took off with a different character. Um, and one of the things that I think worked out very well for us was that we we made the characters, uh, or we came up with a cast of characters, but they were sort of owned jointly. Uh, it, you know, like I wasn't going to be the one who always wrote that particular character you know, and vice versa. Um, so I, I wound up doing the first chapter and then Delilah wrote a chapter about uh, a character that I had actually created, but she wrote the first chapter. It was wonderful. The, the, the dark Lord Toby. Uh, and, and then uh, <laughs> she came up with a character named Fia, who's a very, uh, a gigantic woman warrior. And I wound up writing her first chapter. So things like that, we, we were trading off, uh, we had, we owned the characters jointly, but we were trading off chapters and not worrying about who was writing what it was just, you know, trading off the chapters. And, and that was a really cool, uh, interaction because every time I get an email from Delilah, it was, Oh my gosh, how am I, you know, what kind of goofy zaniness has she come up with this time? You know? And uh, yeah, it, it was just a blast, the whole process. And part cool. of the really cool process that was awesome is that we did it like that. It was like a braid. So Kevin would write chapter one, send it to me. I would edit it and fill the margins with how clever and funny it was. Um, and then I'd write my chapter and send it back to him. And then he would see what I'd done to his chapter, you know, accept or, you know, reject those changes, edit my chapter and then write his chapter. So by the time we were done, we basically had like a third draft. Um, very handy Amazing. process. Crazy. And it was, it was, uh, I was really concerned, um, at the outset that our different chapters would, it would be very clear who wrote which one, but in that process of us editing each other, as we went, what happened is we created unconsciously this hybrid voice. And so I asked my editor who had edited 10 books of mine already. I'm like, can you tell which ones I wrote? And she says, Nope. She had no That's idea. Amazing. And that, that nice. was, that was, yeah, that was what we were going for. That's amazing. It's and, a delight. And in this back and forth braid process that you described, Delilah, how did um how did the humor kind of come forth? Because I think, Kevin, it's incredible that you gave it to your editor and and they said, I don't know whose this is, because humor is something that that a lot of the time feels so personal. And so how did you two go about that during that back and forth writing, editing process of approaching the humor or was it just a matter of like your humor meshed from the get-go as you became friends? I mean, I think it's the concept of when you stop thinking about like, what does the audience want? And you're just like, I'm going to make Kevin laugh until he pees his pants. And that's my job today (laughs) is to make Kevin giggle as much as possible. And and it just became more like one-upping each other in like a very pleasant, like punchy way that I didn't really think about the world at large or the editor is more just like this back and forth of me and Kevin being like, hey, 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 okay. And you know what? And then the morning ones. <laughs> yeah. That was the thing. It, it, the, people keep asking me if I wrote that chapter. I'm like, no, I did not write an entire chapter about a Dick Forrest. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that was Delilah. Uh, that was Delilah me. wrote about the morning wood uh, where the elves live. Um, so yeah, we, it, that map, by the way, con- 
continues to be which Kevin f- drew, which Kevin yeah. drew. It's my favorite thing. Like like uh, the the map for the Tales of Pell series. If you just go in and look at the map, it is full of good times. A lot of puns, and uh, there should be all D and D campaigns should be waged on this map as as far as I am concerned. Um, and it, 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 yeah, it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful time. We told different stories around that map, basically in the other books. Um, and, uh, it, the, the humor really meshed just because we're both very punny, uh, and, and, uh, really enjoy that kind of humor. And what's nice about puns is that it often doesn't require a target, um, other than the language itself. You know what I mean? So it, it's, it's safe humor. It's not going to offend anybody because you're just making wordplay. Um, so, so that we, we really enjoy going there a lot. It was a good time. And then it was also extra fun. Cause like when it was time to story break the second book, we were both at a conference in new Orleans. And so we picked a night that we didn't have to do anything. And we just went from bar to bar on Frenchman street. And in each bar that we'd have a different atmosphere, different music. We try different drinks and we just sat there with, a little notepad and scribbled in it until we had, you know, this kind of raggedy bunch of characters put together and a, a rough idea of the, the overall arc. And then for the third book, we were both in Seattle. Yeah. And so it was, it was Seattle, right? Yeah, it was Seattle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we did like a Seattle kind of, we, we wanted spam Masubi that time. So it was yeah. kind of a more yeah. maritime bar crawl where we went from like fancy sushi to like Hawaiian Masubi to, you know, from, a very delicate uh, violet prosecco for me to like. We had these like four foot tall mai tais, you know, where the, the straw is like yeah. taller than your head, yeah. which influenced the books. It it definitely did. It had that fl- flavor, uh, and I I I enjoyed that process tremendously. I, I I wish I could write all my books that way, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we're we're super proud of them, and uh, hope folks give them a try. They're they're you could read them in any order. So there's three of them. That's a beautiful story. It's like just everyone needs four foot tall Mai Tais to, <laughs> to kickstart <laughs> their book writing process. Well, well, you've left Josiah and I no choice. We're going to Morocco, my friend, and we're writing a book. <laughs> yeah, I, I, would love I, to, I, I, I would love to see what happens I, when you two go to Morocco together. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun, I, but I'm super <laughs> jealous of like crawling down the quarter in New Orleans and coming yeah. up with a book. That sounds like so much fun. New Orleans yeah. is one of my favorite places in the world. That's great. I'm so, so happy for you guys. When I say I'm so happy for you guys, I don't, I don't mean it at all. <laughs> <laughs> jealous, it, jealous. It was bastard. seriously a joy. <laughs> no, I'm very yeah. jealous, very jealous. Uh, well, Nick and Josiah, building on that, that amazing story of, of just teamwork built on bar crawls. Uh, for We're going to future- announce our new, new joint effort. It's called <laughs> yeah. uh, Kings of the Wild Babble. It's coming out next year. <laughs> the Wild Babble series. Do you either of you have 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 people that you you bounce your jokes off of after you've um I'm sure you go through the the rough draft. Uh Nick, I know you you throw a lot of stuff at your brother first. Uh and someone's mentioned uh the ringer of editors and agents and all that. Um but we'll start off with you Nick. For you, who's that person that trusted confidant that you can get those those jokes down on the page and then toss it at them and see if the humor lands. Um, yeah, for me, it is my brother is like my, my first beta reader, and then I have a, my buddy Eugene, who's also my first beta reader. I don't I don't write an email pretty much without sending it to the two of them. Uh, and between the two of them, my brother's a bit more of a yes man. Um, he <laughs> wants me to take every joke further, um, but through. Through him, I know what works and what not to lose. When Eugene, is, who's a bit more critical, um, uh, will tell me to take stuff out, and I'll usually try to preserve what Tyler has told me to keep in. So, I mean, Eugene recently started doing reviews for Grimdark Magazine, and I know his first few reviews, he he like did not get the memo that he was supposed to be like not be really critical, <laughs> and he was really critical. But that's just who he is. Like yeah. he just didn't wasn't pulling punches he wasn't looking for like trying to get a blurb on any book he was just this is what's wrong with this book and so much so that even when he re- re- reads a book that he loves he'll he he'll always try to find something critical to say about it um like he reviewed the black tongue thief which i really love he reviewed actually kevin's book in Sigil. i loved it he was like oh my god like this book was so good i'm like 
I know that guy. <laughs> um, but before I told Kevin that my friend wrote the review, I went to read it because he's like, I did have to say something critical. I have to always have to. And I you don't always it. have to. I read it to make sure. <laughs> And whatever it was, it wasn't too bad, I don't think. Oh, man. But it's nice that you have that that balance between between Tyler and Eugene where you can say, like, I know you well enough to to take your advice and retain this. Yeah. I know you well enough to take your advice and retain this kind of thing. And then those two come together yeah. and create this this perfect mesh. Here's yeah. open. And from a from a reviewer's perspective, I don't do that many book reviews, but when I do uh, I try not to shit on, <laughs> on people because <laughs> I, I talk bless to authors. You. You, you, like, you're doing the good work. <laughs> we're all human, and I know Josiah is very sensitive, so I gave his book a high score. You know, <laughs> thank you, my God. I, I I can't. I can only cry myself to sleep so often from now. I know. I'm just. I know, man. A sweet sponge. I'm trying to be like a like a soother, you know, as opposed to thank ripping you. your heart. Thank out. you. Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> Well, Josiah, do you have uh, anyone that you bounce your your jokes off of, or toss them a first draft and say, "I, know, I have a, a it, cursed doll lands. that I keep in my room." Um, <laughs> I got them from now. I, uh, I I started this whole like crazy thing of writing and creating things with my best friend when I was uh, ten or eleven years old, and he did the covers for the books of Babel, Ian Leno, uh, and I, uh, you know, trust him. Uh, implicitly and and bounce ideas off of all the time and he's very supportive and very encouraging but he'll tell me when i'm like hey that's not the best idea you've ever had or what else you got in the hopper there young grasshopper <laughs> uh so he's very uh essential to the process and and you know i i i would not be where i am without without his guidance and so he's like my beta reader my alpha reader is my wife uh sharon who um uh, has read so much of my terrible dog rule and bullshit over the years that, that it's, <laughs> she deserves an award. If I ever get an award, I'm just going to pass it around to her and be like, here you go. Sorry. Uh, Cause she's, she's yeah, uh, been such a, a, a integral help to my, my craft and development. Uh, yeah. You can't really express it. Awesome. And uh, Nick, I, I, I'll toss this back to you. Um, since you just went to Spain back in November, uh, for was it the launch of Bloody Rose? Uh, yeah, yeah. So you've yeah. got both uh, Kings of the Wild and Bloody Rose in Spanish, but I know all of you have had your works translated to other languages. Have you have you found that the humor doesn't always land in the same way uh, for readers from other countries? Because for me personally, living in Ecuador. My humor does not always land when I speak in Spanish, and I tried, I tried a little too hard at the beginning when I when I was speaking Spanish to infuse my uh, English North American humor in there, and it came across really weird. And so I had to sort of like redevelop my personality with what Spanish. Was your, what, in what, mind. Was your, what was your worst joke? What was the one that really like uh, <laughs> flopped? I want to know. We 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 uh, uh, doing like. That's what she said, sort of like, you know, North American humor. What were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I can't remember because I have a, I have a very often like a dark sense of humor. And uh, uh, one of my best friends is Swedish and uh, he and I, we just, our, our sense of humor gets very, very dark, very quickly. And I think I can't remember cause I kind of blocked these, these memories out of my mind, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, um, because Spanish was such a struggle at first, but with he and I, we, we get to this point of ratcheting up the the weird very quickly mm -hmm. and that happened with one of my wife's high school friends yeah. and he just looked at me that was like what yeah. like give me this face and we were at a party and i was like please please don't like leave me just because i <laughs> <laughs> and, and you thought at that moment i'm gonna wake up in 30 years in the middle of the night and remember this exact moment yeah. this is what's going to stick <laughs> yeah, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna cry, and I'm gonna think of Josiah as I cry. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, so for for Nick, for you, um, you know, when you've heard the feedback from your from your readers from other countries, has the the humor stood out as something that that actually does translate to them? Uh, well, maybe it's different for the others, but I definitely, I don't really just know much about my foreign translations, really. Like, they're kind of so much out of your hands. 
uh, you don't know what has become of the characters. Uh, sometimes I, you know, I use Instagram Translate. Even the titles are like the title in Russia is like Kings of Creepy. <laughs> So, I know, like, that in That's itself awesome. is way funnier than anything I ever wrote. Um, and so, yeah, I have no clue, to be mostly honest. I mean, in Spain, I think the, the guy who did the translation for Spain, more than anyone else, he was like a fan before it got translated. He, he knew before the book, before I knew that it was going to get a Spanish deal and was like, can you please ask if I could translate it? And he went back and forth with me on so many jokes, so many references, so many names just to make sure like if I had a poisonous flower, a person's name was a poisonous flower, that it's a poisonous flower in, in Spanish as well. So things like that. So I think in the, at least the Spanish version that the humor maybe got as close as it's going to get, but otherwise, to be honest, I have no clue. I, I hope so. I, I still need to read your, I'm going to pick up your books in Spanish and see how it, how it flies. I'm very curious. At this yeah, point. hopefully. And uh, Delilah, what about you? Have you had any experiences with translation or uh, any feedback from or comments from from readers overseas? No, my books, unfortunately, haven't really gotten, you know, that I haven't hit it big in Poland or anything like that. Um, I did have some nice back and forth with the uh, Russian translator for Phasma, who was like, what does this mm. word mean? And I'm like, I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. I walked around all day going, Hershka, Lashk, Blorp, Jerk, until something sounded good. Like trying yeah. to explain that. Like, he's like, well, what do I call it in Russian? And I'm like, up to you, man. You, know, you can walk around all day making noises if you want to. I, I don't know. Yeah. The planet's name is Bashka. I don't know. <laughs> but that's, that's as close as I've gotten is just trying to explain how Star Wars would translate into Russian when I just make things up. That's awesome. And it's Star Wars is gibberish to begin with anyways. It's like Kashyyyk. I don't know what this what are you, is. What are you saying? It's got three Ys. <laughs> it's like a, <sighs> someone sneezed in the middle. Kashyyyk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kevin or Josiah, have you had any experiences with translation? Um, I will say that one of the most fascinating things, uh, for me to look at is in translation is Mandarin. Uh, my particular translation, uh, for the Iron Druid Chronicles, uh, what they did is they have footnotes, except they're not footnotes, but because, you know, it's a vertical, uh, language on the page, they have side notes. And, uh, <laughs> what they do is whenever I have a pop culture reference, like a, a movie in English or a, a book or anything that would probably be unfamiliar to readers in Taiwan, they will put in a little side note, rotated sideways in English. So, so that they will put the, the, the title of the movie starring so-and-so or directed by blah, blah, blah. They'll put those little notes on the side. So I can go through the Mandarin, which is all, you know, meaningless to me because I don't read kanji, but I can tell where in the story I'm at because of the references in English That's they crazy. put on the side. Crazy. So uh, I think that that is a fascinating uh, thing that they do. And uh, I love it. Uh, I, and so I am super impressed with them as translators. And apparently they have done a good job. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, people there uh, seem to like it. Um, and, uh, they've just, uh, I, in fact, they just asked to start translating the ink and sigil series. So, um, I'm looking forward oh, to seeing those two. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, That's but really I have, cool. I have no idea how the rest of it works. <laughs> uh, I, I have had right. like in Spanish, for example, um, it apparently didn't work well. Uh, because they translated the first two books and then they're like, That's it. We're not going to do any more. So, it, it apparently just didn't work well when translated to Spanish. And maybe that was some of the same stuff that you were talking about, you know, where you're, you're taking North American humor and it doesn't really translate well to Spanish speaking culture. Perhaps I, I don't know um, what happened there. So, uh, and it's a, so it is, it, yeah, you never know how it's going to go. And it's a bummer because you, your series started to get translated in Spanish, yeah. for instance. And it's just mm -hmm. like, no, it doesn't work anymore. And then, there's probably a few there's probably a bunch of readers in spanish who are like i actually really like this series yeah you know well it, it, and then it they can't across. finish it in their own language yeah they, funniest <laughs> books i ever read <laughs> yeah it, well they'll they'll tweet uh, occasionally in spanish it'll come they'll they'll tag me in, in twitter and like and they tag the publisher like where the hell are the rest of the books exactly and uh yeah, yeah it, and so um i there's nothing i can do obviously so uh it's the way it goes. Uh, that, that's 
uh, an unfortunate thing about foreign translation is you don't know how well the translation will work and how well it was marketed. You have no control over any of that kind of stuff. Uh, you just kind of take the the advance if they give you one and, you know, Hope that count your out. blessings that you're, yeah, that anybody was even interested, but, you know. But, so. but still, like, crazy to think that people, like, around the world are experiencing your stories. That's That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Josiah, have you had any experiences with translation? Well, my biggest success was Esperanto, which I'm trying to bring back. Um, I translated it myself. Uh, so, no, I mean, I, like, you know, a, a couple, but I, I, I have never, uh, yeah, I've never had any sort of back and forth with like the uh, uh, translators, uh, except for like, you know, clarification questions. But, it, it, you know, like Nick is saying, and uh, it's, it's, there's, there's really not a, a permeable surface between the author and the publisher and the publisher and like foreign rights or like foreign publishers. Like it's like another, I mean, like I I discover the covers of my books when they are released by the publisher, you know, and if they change the title, that's when you discover it. Like, you know, like, Oh, we decided to change this to a different thing. And you just find about it on on Twitter or whatever. So we are not consulted. I'm not consulted. I'm sure like other people are consulted. I'm not consulted. I'm just, you know, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it's really, it's cool to think that uh, a translator has to sit there and try to puzzle out the garbage that I've spewed in the past. Like, what did this mean? <laughs> now I have to do this in Russian? Oh my God, here we go. You know, that's, that's fun. And then on top of that, it's like the books get longer with each one. Longer, <laughs> longer. And he got like a thesaurus in the third book. He just loved apparently. And now the words are all weird. What's going on? Yeah, no. Oh, man. Well, uh, Josiah, since we're on you, if you could offer some advice to listeners and viewers who are interested in writing humorous fiction or are currently writing that they want to include more humor into their work. If you have some advice for them. What what would I tell them to do? Um, Go to art school, (laughs) because that's hilarious. (laughs) It's a waste of money. You'll feel like exposed the entire time. You'll have to do like regular critiques. Uh, no one's going to get your work. Now, I, I, what would I say you should do? Um, you know, um, go to like coffee shops and eavesdrop. Like just listen to the people. People are hilarious. Like most of the best content in the world is stolen at bus stops. Like, you know, just just be a, <laughs> an, a, an eavesdropper and you'll get a lot of good stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, what else can you do? Um yeah, I think you know, just um, go, uh, go to comedy clubs so you know exactly what not to do. Like, I didn't know what like anti humor was until I started going to open mic comedy stuff, and then you're like, oh, this is like where where humor goes to die. So that was informative. Um, yeah, I mean, the usual stuff. Yeah, just uh, go to places where humor dies to realize how to do humor. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And Delilah, what about you? If you have some advice for for viewers or listeners who want to get into writing humorous fiction. I mean, I know Josiah was kind of joking there, but um, when I was first starting out as a writer, I joined a local writers group. Um, It was the biggest blessing. We met once a month and uh, the leader brought writing exercises and a timer and we would just throw stuff out of nowhere. Uh, So we had no idea what to expect. It wasn't like where you show up and read 14 pages of your epic of the elf wars. It was just like you show up and he's like, here's a photo of a parakeet kicking a guy in the face, write a story, you have 10 minutes. Um, and then we would all write and then we would read them out loud. And it was as close as I guess you can come to getting that kind of live response that you want and having it be more like, you know, stand up comedy. Um, so I learned a lot, not only about what didn't, didn't work in my voice, but like listening to other people and what really tickled me when they wrote it was really helpful. So, you know, I, I think that's super helpful for the same reasons as I was mentioning in that, uh, you have to think on your feet fast. You have to read it out loud. You have to take criticism and give criticism. And it's, it's really valuable. Yeah. And Nicholas, what's uh, some advice that you have to offer? Um, mine would be, and this is maybe not, I mean, obviously all advice is very subjective, but don't listen to him. Um, you know, if you're a funny person, um, maybe don't try to hide that. You know, like I said, I tried to write a book for 13 years that was not at all funny. Um, and so, don't maybe don't be afraid of letting your own personality, your own kind of brand of humor out there. Cause it may be more, you know, uh, widely beloved than you expected. Um, and then otherwise, yeah, I mean, 
yeah, I don't know. I have to watch, watch funny stuff, read funny stuff, read funny books. I mean, if my books got translated, translated into Mandarin, it would just be in the brackets. It would say dumb and dumber, 1996, <laughs> dumb and dumber, 1996. Like most of my jokes are from that movie. Um, <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, but yeah, no, just, I mean, if you're, it's hard to imagine a not funny person writing a funny book. Yeah. You're either going to be funny or you're just smart enough to write funny, which could happen as well. But um, yeah, just d- rather not rather than try to write it, try not don't try to not write it. If that makes any sense whatsoever. Like don't hide your humor mm-hmm. when you're writing a book. Yeah, and that ties into what you said, you said earlier about your own writing, where you realized I found my voice, and that just happened to include a lot of humor, as opposed yeah. to being Steven Erickson. Mixed with Brandon Sanderson. Mixed yeah, with whatever if else. a joke comes to mind, put it out there as opposed to being like, oh no, this would never happen. Yeah. No. And Kevin, what about you? Some uh, advice that you can offer? I think the reading is super important. Uh, and while you're reading humorous books or books that have humor in them, um, when, when you laugh, uh, take the time to go back over that and you know, then figure it out why. You know, explain the joke to yourself. Why does this work? And um, so you'll start to notice patterns about certain things that you find really funny. You know, there might be other jokes in there and you, maybe you're not laughing as hard. And that's also worthwhile. What isn't making you laugh, but you recognize is probably supposed to be a joke. Why isn't it working for you? Um, and uh, I, you know, going through the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, for example, um, I start to look at how he structures things and some of the, a large part of the humor sometimes is just his phrasing and his unusual syntax, you know, that like he was, what he was doing, he was It's surprised. called being British, Kevin. It, it, that, there you go. <laughs> it, it, it was a, the surprise of the phrasing is often very cool. So yeah, I, I enjoyed uh, uh, breaking down what worked in the Hitchhiker's Guide. Uh, and then of course, you know, uh, you know, the spell singer stuff and um, the other things that I've enjoyed, I, I've always go back and, and maybe t- take another read uh, and then say, why did I like that? And uh, try to learn uh, from being a critical reader. Mm-hmm. And this is very similar to the things. You I've know, I, I, like as ahead, a, a lapsed college professor, hearing the phrase <laughs> critical reader <laughs> makes my heart sing. So I'm, I'm a, with you. <laughs> I'm a former high school English teacher. So there you go. Ah, brother. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome. That that reminds me of a, I can't remember who it was, but a comedian that I was just watching a, an interview with them and them explaining how they, obviously you have to go through the attrition of going up and doing uh, open mic nights and stuff like that, but then also going back and deconstructing the comedy specials of their favorite comedians. But then also after they do their own comedy specials, going back and deconstructing their own comedy specials and figuring out like, that's where I fucked up. That's where I fucked up. This worked. That kind of thing worked. That didn't, not so much. And it kind of ties back to what you said earlier, Delilah, of that comedian that goes up there for, to tell however many jokes, one lands, they do that a hundred times, and then they have 40 jokes that work. But how many dozens upon dozens upon dozens of jokes did not land? And then how many did they have to toss out? So it's kind of like finding who's, that that uh, who's, who's that uh, perseverance that yeah that that stand up uh, comedian who just had one liners his whole routine was uh, it was Stephen oh, Stephen Wright Stephen Stephen Wright Stephen Wright yeah yeah, yeah. 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 He, he just said and they're they're not connected in any way it's just mm-hmm. uh, they, you know he just says these things you know I once put you know de- I had some dehydrated water but I didn't know what to add you know I mean just, just yeah, weird yeah. stuff like yeah. that. <laughs> And and that was his whole routine was that kind of process, you know, of one liners right. that worked somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And it's like a uh, ADD on stage, you yeah. know, but then you actually have to go back and, and I mean, in, in the case of a comedian, you would have to have someone film what you're doing in order to, to be able to watch it again and deconstruct it. But in your cases as authors, you can take your own writing and as you're going through the editing process, you can deconstruct what you've written and, and figure out like that doesn't work so much, et cetera, et cetera. My, my, my favorite part of publication is that I never have to read that book again. And I do wonder sometimes <laughs> like when I talk to the writers, like, Oh, and I go back and I study what I've done. I'm like, I don't want to go back and read that again. Like I spent like a, a year or whatever it was. Like, do it. I do. I, it's in here. I don't want, 
so like the, the idea of like studying my own work to see what lands and what doesn't oh my god please save me from that i mean do you guys like read your stuff i mean obviously when you're <laughs> i just forget it i got a goldfish memory it's gone gone <laughs> Awesome. I 100 percent do. I uh, I honestly like because because I if I write I get too say bogged down and stuff. Uh-huh. And I do like I do enjoy the process of going back and uh, and reading my earlier books because they remind me just to keep things funny. And I'm like, look how fast this was. Look how you just moved and moved and moved. You didn't sit there and fucking describe useless shit. So so you see like the beauty and the humor in it still. Like, it's still like like you're still enjoyable. Oh yeah, I was like, who fucking wrote this? Is uh, it nice. me? How? <laughs> Well, I get that on the first pass pages yeah. when like it's been gone for six months and then the edits show up and I'm like, oh, this is pretty good. Mm. <laughs> Just like, yeah. Yeah. Well, but once it's out. in paper and I can't change anything, absolutely not. Yeah. Mm. It's like put that on your shelf and that's it. Well, I'm doing that. Uh, I, I get to change things. So I'm doing that right now with my old Iron Druid Chronicles uh, because mm-hmm. they're coming out with reissues this year, the 10 year anniversary things. So congratulations. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I can't believe I, I get to do this. And um, there, since I'm making, you know, changes, um, I, I am having to read through the whole thing again. And uh, it, it's it's been instructive. And, uh, and, it's fine. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and also, in a way, a relief, because I'm like, my God, I can finally change this one thing that's been haunting me every night. Oh, for, you know. yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, it's been nice in that regard. Um, but I, cool. as a rule, I, I wouldn't, unless I had an opportunity to, to actually change it, then I probably wouldn't go back otherwise. Hmm. She's like, leave it as it is, mistakes and all. Mm-hmm. Delilah, go for it. Can I add one thing? Yeah. Um, just it, back to the advice aspect um, for, for writers that want to write humor, like don't put you down, I think is a thing that we all just assume so we don't say but that has to be said which Mm. is just that this is not a world in which punching down is going to get you ahead in publishing or elsewhere so you know punch out put sideways make make puns but don't punch down yeah well and all all, absolutely and also like power is just generally not funny like i i have not read a lot of like people speaking from a point of like you know great power being humorous because humor is vulnerable Humor is like it, it's messy, and like when you have like accrued like your 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 sanctum of 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 control, you don't want messy. You don't want like anything that's uncertain. And so I I, I think that like uh, still to this day, like comedy is revolutionary in its heart. So don't punch down, but also keep telling jokes because we need them. Yeah, hundred percent agree. And uh, on that note, we'll uh, bring this panel to a close. If everyone can recommend what they're currently reading, uh, watching, listening to, uh, and then also if you could recommend one of your top funny books, at least something that's not been mentioned yet that you would recommend to viewers and listeners. So Nick, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, I I don't think this is any sort of secret, but I recently was very fortunate enough and honored enough to write, be able to write a forward to there's a special edition of the Black Tongue Thief coming out. Um, and someone asked me to write a forward to it. And I'm like, I don't have time for this. And then I looked up forward and I was like, oh, this is quite an honor. I have to make time. So I did. Um, and uh, now the sales should just come rolling in. But uh, reading that book again, like I read, I loved it when I read it. And it is so goddamn funny. Even the very first chapter, which is not a long chapter, I probably threw my head back and laughed about six times. Um, just genius, genius, genius humor. And some of it's slapstick, some of it's not, some of it's just language. Um, and so I recently reread about at least half that book so that I could, you know, have it more fresh in my mind. Um, and as far as if you're looking for a funny book, um, it's great. Right on. And what are you currently reading or yeah. watching or listening to, Nick? Um, well, God, watching everything out of the sun. I finished <laughs> the first season of Succession, which is pretty damn good if you haven't seen it yet. Um, and I'm putting it on hold so I can maybe catch up to like Boba Fett or Peacemaker. I don't know. I think I'm going to watch Peacemaker because I really like, like, I do like watching humorous stuff. When I watched the remake of the new Guardian, or not Guardians of the Galaxy, um, The Suicide Squad, that movie was hugely inspirational to me because it's just like, it's funny. It's exactly the kind of thing I'm trying to write. Uh, And so, yeah, here's hoping Peacemaker kind of lights the fire. Um, But yeah, that's about it. John Cena keeping Nick's humor alive. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And uh, Delilah, what about you? Some... Uh, a recommendation, something very funny for listeners and viewers to to check out, and then also what you're currently reading, watching, listening to. 
Yeah, I'm like right now I'm mostly reading books I have to blurb and then I uh, I have to read stuff very different from what I'm writing. So I've just been reading a whole bunch of like psychological thrillers that I buy off BookBub <laughs> pretty cheap. So it's just terrible things happening to women with no humor whatsoever. Uh, uh, so that that is not apropos <laughs> that remain to this conversation. <laughs> um, I, we, we did just start Peacemaker last night and it was it was a delight. Um, I enjoy the work of James Gunn. And of course, we watched only murders in the building, um, Ted Lasso, uh, Mythic Quest. I like Mythic Quest so much that I got kind of like sad that I, there wasn't any more nearby. So I started watching It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, nice. which once you accept that there are no consequences <laughs> is very entertaining. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. And, and then what was the last one? Recommend. Uh, so that, that that's what you're currently reading or watching. Okay. Um, okay but then yeah. something funny that that you absolutely love a book that you would recommend to listeners and viewers oh you know we've talked about so many of them like i think hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy is the funniest book i've ever read in my life um but i will say a book that uh snuck up on me was charlene harris's dead after dead until dark um which it, the tv show true blood is based on if you've only seen the tv show true blood you are going to think that it is um, a vampire soap opera but the book itself is very funny and especially like, I just remember reading it and thinking like, oh my God, we're allowed to have redneck vampires. Like, why wasn't I told this is my world? <laughs> it was groundbreaking, but there's this kind of Southern humor to it that is, you get so used to like Lestat and Twilight and these, these vampires. And then you start reading this and you're like, okay, well, these vampires just like go to biker bars and drink their cheap blood beer and like get in fights and just, they're just idiots. And it's, it was really pleasant. To see vampires being something other than the Prince of Darkness. That sounds fantastic. And I'm curious how they how they went through the adaptation process to create True Blood out of that. They were like, this is a great idea. Add more boobs. Yeah. <laughs> it's like three times, five times more sex. Yeah. And that's it. Well, I just remember like there was this one scene in the book where like, you know, Eric the vampire, like he's, it's played by, you know, Alexander Skarsgård. Like he's tall, he's beautiful, he's all this. And then there's one where like she shows up in his crypt and like, you know, his assistant is like bleaching the streaks into his hair because you think he's just naturally beautiful, but he, he's getting a manicure. He's getting his hair done. <laughs> like this does not happen naturally. I don't wake up like this. What are you talking about? <laughs> and uh, Josiah, what about you? If you have uh, a funny book to recommend to people and then let us know what you're reading, watching, listening to. So I have a three-year-old right now. So uh, like we're really into the Care Bears. Um, uh, they're not really <laughs> funny, but there are a lot of properties surrounding their existence. Uh, no, I think I, 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 uh, when we have time to watch something right now, we're watching like everybody's saying like Ted Lasso. Uh, you know, we're watching the Bob, book of Boba Fett, uh, uh, which I, I really like. I, I really like to read the early reviews where I'm like, this is terrible and the worst thing that's happened on TV. I'm like, I probably will enjoy it. And then go watch it and we enjoyed it. <laughs> um, so uh, we've watched that. We're looking forward to like the new season of Mrs. Maisel. Um, like that's like one of our favorite shows on the last couple of years. Uh, as far as books, I am, I'm, I'm punishing myself. Like I'm just going to be totally honest. I'm reading some Joseph Conrad. Because I wanted to write something that was um, making fun of that sort of milieu. And so I'm reading The Shadow Line, which is sort of a uh, – it's not interesting. Anyway, so I'm reading that. I would not recommend it. It's a terribly racist, awful book. But I want to make fun of it later. Josiah, did you, uh, did you uh, finish Voltaire? You're, you're reading I a book by did, Voltaire. I did, and it was, <laughs> it was awful. I hated every minute of it. People should not read that garbage. Um, but like I said, I'm, I, I'm, I, I am plumbing the depths of the past to um, make hay in the, in the present. Um, the book that I would recommend that I read that is humorous recently is Connie Willis's To Say Nothing of the Dog, her um, uh, was, uh, the, the Doomsday Books uh, trilogy is amazing. It's, it's very funny. It's witty. Uh, she is a person who really understands puns and, and language plays. If you enjoy that, you will enjoy that. She also just understands the absurdity of like the human condition. So she has these characters who are just innately funny. Um, so yeah, uh, Connie Willis, uh, to say nothing of the dog, I would really recommend that. Not the Joseph Conrad. Don't or read Voltaire. that. Don't, don't, oh, Voltaire. Nope, don't read that either. <laughs> also garbage. <laughs> I'm just, just doing like, it for hey, the internet points. You're, you're a masochist slash humorist. So. I know. Josiah, yeah. have you watched Adventure Time? I love Adventure Time. Okay. Yes. 
That's what we watched when we got sick of our children's shows. And we're like, there must be something that the children can safely watch that we will enjoy. And that was like the holy, <laughs> the, the perfect I holy grail of what to watch. Oh, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. I will. <laughs> and we also like um, Summer Camp Island. Summer Camp Island is also very similar. And that's why I'm Summer not Camp, insane. I don't know. <laughs> I need to write that one down. Summer Camp Island. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's great. And uh, we'll finish off with Kevin. Uh, if you can give some recommendations and uh, let everyone know what you're reading and watching and listening yeah. to. Um, in terms of uh, like a series that I, I was introduced to this by my kid. And uh, it, it's on Netflix. It's called Hilda. It's yeah. uh, a, a very lovely, just a, a warm, <laughs> gentle, and um, heart heartwarming kind of uh, series about this uh, girl who kind of lives out in nature and has to move to the city. But there are trolls, and there are other you know fun little um, you know mythological creatures that that come around a thunderbird and things like that. So. Um, I love that there's this kid who just always has a bug on him. Uh, you know, just random <laughs> little, little things like that. Yeah. Just, I, I love it. And um, so there's two seasons right now, plus a movie, I think on Netflix, if you want to check that out. Um, and then in terms of uh, reading, um, I'm going to recommend a graphic novel that still makes me laugh. Uh, I go back to it every so often. It's called Chew, C-H-E-W. And um, both in the written word and visually it is a hilarious series that it follows the exploits of a uh, a guy who could basically bite into anything and then get a vision of where that thing originated so if it's an orange he's going to figure out exactly where in florida you know it grew what pesticides were used you know things like that but it helps him solve murders through, you know, Whoa. just a tiny bit of cannibalism. If, uh, you know, <laughs> if he basically, you know, takes a little drop of blood of the, or whatever of the dead body, he knows how they died. So oh, wow. that that is a, an interesting thing. And then there's just a, and a bunch of different food-based powers, you know, that get introduced over the course of the series by, you know, different uh, people that are on the side of law enforcement, but also people that are villains, uh, the the guy who could sculpt chocolate into anything was probably my favorite, uh, you know, because he's making swords, you know, that once he's done with it, yes, it's made of chocolate, but it's actually functional as a, a deadly sword. So I, I was like, wow, this is great. I, I just had the best time with it. Um, and I, I would recommend that to anybody who likes comics. Um, and so there you go. Yeah, that's uh, what I'm reading and, or, you know, would recommend to read or watch. Uh, and uh, then I would uh, also recommend, of course, The Tales of Pell. Yes. Any one of those three books. <laughs> and uh, I wholeheartedly recommend Hilda as well. Like you, that, that series is just a warm hug. It's really nice. Yeah. yeah and it's been, awesome. a nice, uh, it's been a nice contrast to the pandemic and all the shit that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> one more like if I one more quick recommendation for funny books is uh Orconomics and its sequel Son of a Lich uh <laughs> is hilarious. Okay. It's just an absolute send up of like the business the business in general the way wealth works, the way companies work, advertising works. Um yeah, it's and it's the closest thing I've read to Terry Pratchett that's not Terry Pratchett, but it's kind of its humor is very 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 funny. Fantastic. Yeah. Also uh yeah. some science fiction for anyone uh, who's interested John Scalzi's interdependency series is great space opera, but it also blends in humor in a very nice way. There's some great characters in that series and it's done because it's John Scalzi. Of course it's done. Uh, and then uh, saga by, yeah. uh, I think it's Brian K Vaughn and who's the artist Fiona again? Staples. Fiona Staples. Thank you, Delilah. That series is fantastic because it touches on so much of what we talked about in terms of balancing humor with emotional stakes. And I think the series is getting, uh, so it has 10 issues right now and it's starting again after the author and the artist. Well, I think 10 volumes, right? Like, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Ish, yeah, it's got it's like a thick one. issues. Yeah. Least. So it's like 10, yeah. 10 volumes that are 50, 50 ish pages or something like that. I can't remember, but yeah, they're, they're starting that series up again. And continuing the story. So that's another one that's worth getting into if you're into comic books. That's awesome. And uh, Josiah, Delilah, Kevin, Nicholas, 
thank you so much for for joining me and joking around with me and talking about humor and satire in science fiction and fantasy. If you could uh, let viewers and listeners know where they can find you on social media, where they can buy your books, if you want to pimp them a little bit more. Uh, so Delilah, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, I'm easy to find. I am Delilah S. Dawson pretty much everywhere. Um, Twitter, Instagram, my website is DelilahSDawson.com. My books are available pretty much everywhere. Um, you can order from your favorite indie, from your favorite online place. My next book that's out is not funny at all. It's called The Violence, um, and it is kind of a intergenerational saga of three women using a pandemic of random brutal violence to break out of um, abusive relationships uh, and also join pro wrestling. Nice. So it's got a couple of moments <laughs> of levity, but overall, it's it's a much more violent book. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, The Tales of Hell. Of course. And Kevin, what about you? Where can people find you? Uh, I'm Kevin Hearn. Uh, I got the E on the end of my name for some random reason. But uh, yeah, KevinHearn.com and uh, Kevin Hearn on Twitter and Instagram. Um, I've got a lot of, uh, you know, nature photography mixed in with the the book stuff and uh, recipes or whatever like that that I do. Um, and then uh, it, in terms of uh, books, you might want to try out Ink and Sigil. Uh, that's uh, my kind of my latest uh, series. It's a lot of fun. I have an epic fantasy called The Seven Kennings that starts with a plague of giants. Um, and then I also have uh, the Iron Druid Chronicles, of course, which begins with Hounded. But uh, definitely try out the Tales of Pell. Kill the Farm Boy, No Country for Old Gnomes, and the Princess Beard uh, that I wrote with and Lila. Those are a blast. Just to piggyback off of that, if you really are an audiobook reader, uh, Luke Daniels does the audiobooks for all of Kevin's books and the Tales of Pell, and it is a treat. He does voices for everybody, and it just really enhances the humor of it uh, like yeah. tenfold. It's amazing. Fantastic. And Josiah, what about you? Uh, my name is Josiah. And if you uh, want to get in contact with me, you can <laughs> lean out the window and shout to the street. <laughs> I am not on social media and I uh, don't have anything to promote. Oh, no, I, I, I will have a book coming out this next year called The Hexologists. Uh, so we'll see if that works out. Thanks. And you also have the Books of Babel, which is... I yes, finished, also the books series. of Babel. Like, you know, I should write... And you got to promote yourself. This, What's going this, on? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, and also the Books of Babel. <laughs> which has been acclaimed by my mother, myself, and uh, my daughter. <laughs> so um, check it out. <laughs> Aren't you, Nick? <laughs> Go for it, Nick. Uh, well, I'm not that active on shithole. I mean, Facebook anymore. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm on Twitter at Nicholas underscore Eames and then Instagram uh, at the Book of Eames. And if you like pictures of like books or my TV with anime whiskey. on it or bottles of whiskey or coffee, then that's the place for you. Um, yeah. And if you're reading, uh, I, I have two books, Kings of the Wild and Bloody Rose. And if you've read them or, um, are going to read them, you can also find some Spotify playlists for them on Spotify, also curated by the book of Eames. Um, the first one's sort of a seventies, you know, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd kind of stuff. And the second one is like eighties walking on sunshine and Pat Benatar and that kind of stuff. So yeah, those Spotify playlists are great. Great for road trips. Yes. Not not so much for writing books, even though Nick did that. <laughs> not so much for writing books. Good for housework too, though, yes. as well. Yeah. Fixing holes in roofs, yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you guys so much. It was an absolute pleasure to chat with you all. And yeah, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Awesome. Thank, you. thank you so much.